Take your Bibles. Turn to Second Chronicles. I think I'll preach. I think I'll go ahead and preach this message. This is what I was going to preach last week. God led me in a different direction. I just I felt like God was doing that. And um, based on the comments that I received after the message, that was the right way to go. And I like I like doing what God says. Bible tells us to let all things be done decently and in order. And I've learned the value of preparing, practicing, um, doing things in a right way. We, we follow an order in our service. We generally, we'll sing, we'll visit fellowship, take up an offering, giggle a little bit, laugh a little bit, sing some more, take up the offering, do the service. But there's been times when God just laid it on my heart and I said, I'm going to preach. I'm going to let all that other stuff go to, go to side for a while and I'm going to preach and God will move in me to preach. And so you don't want to get so stuck down in the mud that you can't change a little bit. Amen. And, and let God use you. Second Chronicles chapter 30. Uh, this is something that once it occurred to me what, what God was doing and how God was laying this out from, from my understanding. It was a blessing. Let me ask you a question as we get into this. Um, this, the theme of the sermon, I don't know the title of it, but the theme of the certain sermon is a pardon. And the king, Hezekiah, is going to issue a pardon to everybody that had prepared themselves for what they were doing and prepared themselves for this Passover feast that they were having. When I use that term pardon what does that imply especially well you know we we could use it like this if you are trying to get around somebody at the store or at the mall or wherever it is you would say pardon me and that is a, a kind way that's that's another way of saying would you get out of my way please get Get out, move. Okay? Somebody's, what? People block an entire aisle at Walmart. Stand, I mean, there's lanes, right? Keep the lane moving. But they block the whole thing, and you're just standing there with your cart. Now, I try to be patient. I don't just run away. Because those people might show up for church one Sunday. So I say, pardon me. Excuse me. The word pardon, that's actually in other languages, pardon. Okay? So we use it that way, but in the context where the king says, I'm giving you a pardon, what does that imply? What does it mean? You were saying something? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Setting them free. Huh? To allow them, okay? These are all good. What I have up on the screen, the heading up there says judicial pardon. And I want you to think about that term. And as we read this text, a judicial pardon. All right? Second Chronicles chapter 30, verse 17. The context we've been in this area for a while hezekiah is now king and god is using him there's going to be revival they're going to celebrate the passover they missed the first month of passover because they were not they were not they were unclean and god granted them legally because it was written in the law that they if they were unclean for the first time the passover on the second month they could have a second passover and remember, that's a, I preach that, that's God giving you a second chance. Because you did things wrong the first time, you have to learn your lesson, and God's giving you another chance to set things right. God is a God of second chances, amen? And that fits in 
with what I have written up there. A judicial pardon. So let's read this in verse 17 of 2 Chronicles chapter 30. Well, there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified. Therefore the Levites had the charge of the killing of the Passovers for everyone that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. Remember, there was a, and there is a process by which a sinner who is stained with his sins can be cleansed and sanctified. And let me say this, time doesn't do it. Let me explain what I mean by that. Just because you sinned 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, and you don't feel bad about it anymore, that doesn't mean that it has gone away. There is a Catholic cardinal. And I want to give you his name, Cardinal Pell. I, from what I understand, he was a British Roman Catholic priest who was the archbishop in Australia. He had a lifetime as a priest molesting boys. They finally caught him on an occasion where he molested two boys right after the service in a room set aside for the priest where he disrobes because he might still be holy from the Catholic Mass. He might have a crumb of holiness on him from the Eucharist and he's in this sacred room called the sacristy and he molested two boys in that room. They, the parents filed charges against him. They had his trial. The jury found him guilty and sent, the judge sentenced him to, he, now he's an old man, the judge sentenced him to multiple years in prison and said basically I've given you a life sentence in prison because I know you're not going to live past the 30 years that I give you. And the judge laid into this man for what he had done. And he said, I, I have no doubt that there's others out there, but we got you on these two. Did you know the Supreme Court of Australia overturned that whole conviction, set that man loose? Do you not see the corruption in, the, in that judicial system? They turned that man, he's still a cardinal. Time doesn't erase the sins. You must be washed. So that's, that's, what, that's what sanctified them was the sacrifice of the lambs. You understand that? Verse 18, for a multitude of the people, even many of Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar, Zebulun, four groups, that's gospels there, had not cleansed themselves, yet did they eat the Passover otherwise, and it was written. Now watch this, but Hezekiah prayed for them. Let me tell you, let me tell you, you've got somebody praying for you right now. Now it may be a family member. It may be your mama. It may be your daddy. It may be... Your daughter, your son. It may be people that know you. Somebody's praying for you. But let me tell you who else is. Jesus Christ. You see, if I was to ever commit a, a crime. Or, I'll say it this way. If I was ever accused of a crime. I would want a good attorney. If I knew I was innocent, if I knew I was innocent, I would want a good lawyer to help represent me. And I, I listen, everybody makes comments about defense attorneys, how they're scum of the earth. Well, let me tell you, defense attorneys in this country have forced the government to follow its own rules. Fingerprints came about as a result of defense attorneys making sure that the police had the right man. Now it's DNA evidence. And if I remember right, they just set a man free after 30 years, set him free of a rape charge because the DNA showed it wasn't him. You 
have an advocate with the judge. Bible says Jesus Christ, the righteous. He will be on your side to stand up for you. Watch this now. Even if you did it, you have a defense attorney who has a way out for you. Judicially. According to the law. So he said, but Hezekiah prayed for them saying, the good Lord pardon everyone that prepareth his heart to seek God. Now this cardinal, he did not confess anything. Do you know what that tells me? He's not sorry. And I have no doubt that he used his influence behind the scenes. The Vatican or somebody put pressure on those judges to overturn that man's conviction. He's not sorry. He's not saying, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. I'm so sorry that I hurt these people. He's not saying that. He's just trying to get away with it. But those who are sorry, those who wish, who understand that their sins caused harm to somebody. The good Lord, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. And the children of Israel that were present at Jerusalem kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing with loud instruments unto the Lord. I like singing with loud instruments. Amen. And Hezekiah spake, and some people are going, oh, it's too loud. And Hezekiah spake comfortably unto all the Levites that taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And they did eat throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making, listen to this, making confession to the Lord God of their fathers. So I've asked the question today, who wants, who wants a pardon? Let's pray. Father, help me preach this message. I hope it's a blessing to somebody. I thank you, God, for the meaning of it. I thank you, God, for what you've done for me. I'm the guilty one. No doubt about it. That day when I stood before that judge with that ticket, and he asked me, how do you plead? I, Lord, I had to say guilty. I was speeding. I was guilty. There's no doubt about it. Thank you, God, that a conscience witnessed. A co my conscience was there with me witnessing the event. And I could not bear the guilt that my conscience was bearing witness against me. And Father, we stand guilty before you. And our conscience knows it. Because our conscience was there with us when we did these things. And it's our conscience, Lord, that drives us to the cross to ask for pardon. Because the punishment that we face is too great and we don't want it. So, Lord, open our eyes and help us to, understand, help us to see our sins. Help us to see the consequences of those sins. And help us, dear God, to seek a pardon from the judge. Bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. now turn in your Bible, let me, uh, turn in your Bible to uh, Nehemiah chapter 9. And I'm going to read some things here to you. This is from Webster's Dictionary. The word pardon, it actually, our, the English language, I don't know if you know this or not, I like studying this, English language there almost is no such thing because we've got words from Latin, Greek. We get, we get words from all these other languages. And the word pardon is from a Latin phrase, per dono, which means to give. It is a granting of something. For having the sense of the English for in forgiveness and the Latin word remitto, remitted, from, your sins have been remitted or the crime... You have been remitted of the crime to give back or to take away. 
So Webster wrote, to forgive, to remit, as an offense or crime. Guilt implies of being bound or subjected to censure, penalty or punishment. In order to receive a pardon, there is a condition for that pardon. And that condition is guilt. You must recognize that you are in fact guilty of what you were charged with. There is a reason why President Trump is not issuing a pardon to General Michael Flynn. It's because Michael Flynn is not guilty. He's not guilty. And there is an Obama judge who keeps, he's going against the law because the prosecutor dropped the charge against him. And when the prosecutor drops the charge, the judge does not have a right to say, well, I'm going to try him anyway because there is nobody to accuse him. He can't judge him because there is no accuser. There's no evidence. And that's what's going on in that Flynn case. You follow that. There is a reason why our president, who has the right to pardon him, will not pardon him. And Flynn don't want it because Flynn says, I didn't do anything wrong, Wayne. And I believe him. They set him up. And they told him to keep his mouth shut because Flynn knows where all the bodies are buried. He knows what's going on. Now watch this. It is a... It is a to forgive the penalty or punishment. To pardon is to give up this obligation and release the offender. We apply the word to the crime or to the person. We pardon an offense when we remove it from the offender and consider him as not guilty. Even though he is guilty. He is judicially recognized as not having done the crime. He is now free and not guilty. Now you think about that. Because each one of us are going to go to God's courtroom. Do you understand that? Every body, not just the Christians, not just the people who believe in Christ, the people who don't believe in Christ are going to stand in judgment by Jesus Christ and be judged and be condemned. Because they refused to admit their sins, and to ask for forgiveness. They refused it. They denied it. And so they won't get it. But everybody must appear before the great judge. And that judge, he's going to pull out, listen to me now, he's going to pull out a list of things that you don't want read out loud. He's going to read off things that you think that nobody knows. He's going to read all things that you forgot about. Crimes and offenses that you did that, and when you think about it, guess who's coming to testify? Number one, your conscience. The Bible says their, their conscience bearing witness against them. Your conscience is going to show up in the courtroom, sit up and take a stand and say, I was with him the whole time. I saw everything he did. And if he says he didn't do it, he's lying because I was with him and I saw him. That's exactly... And the devil, by the way, the devil's there too. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. He's standing in courtroom. He's waiting to take the stand. He said, I, he not only did it, I talked him into it. It was my idea. But he did it. He did it. I was there. And I wrote it all down. So you got two witnesses against you. You're toast. And when you ask yourself the question, can I bear going to prison? For some reason, this must have been on my mind last night because I had a dream I was in prison with my brother-in-law, Steve. We were both in prison. And it wasn't fun. I'm going, what am I doing here? Oh, no. How did I, you know, those dreams where you just show up someplace, you have no idea how you got there, that I'm just in prison. And the food was terrible. But I want you to think about the eternity of the lake of fire. See, American prisons have gotten easy. Prisons in other countries. Michael, does anybody want to go to a Kenya prison? You don't want to go to a Kenya prison. 
Likewise, you don't want to spend eternity in God's lake of fire prison. Because the Bible says it is everlasting punishment. And it never stops. And if you think about that and decide that you cannot bear that punishment, then come to the one who can forgive you and pardon you. In Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 16, But they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments. Refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that, that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. He's, he's basing this on, on Numbers chapter 13 and 14. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness and forsookest them not. The fact that you still live and breathe in this world is God being gracious to you long enough for you to come to Him and say, God, will you forgive me? You could have died in your sins. Amen. How many people do you know that have died that way? Died in their sins. And you know it. You know they weren't saved. You know they were not right with God. And you know, and we don't like to think about this when it comes to our loved ones and our relatives, but we know where they are. But God let you live long enough and He was slow to anger with you and merciful and God let you live long enough to be saved. Now, guess what? All the forms of the word guilt are found exactly 39 times in the King James Bible. Does that 39 ring a bell? Does that ring a bell with anybody? What is that? That's the number of books in the law. 39 books in the Old Testament. That's the law. You're, guess what? You're guilty. Here's what Paul said, Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know what, that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Who is guilty before God? The Bible says everybody in the world is guilty. And every mouth may be stopped. You know what that is? That's the judge saying, will you shut up? I like it when Judge Judy does that. Would you shut up? I'm going to turn your microphone off. Don't over talk me. And she knows when somebody starts talking fast like that, they're trying to excuse or lie about what they really did. And she knows it. And she'll say, shut up. Stop talking. Because I know you're guilty. The evidence is here. It's written in the books. It's recorded. Your conscience witness against you. The devil's witness against you. Angels were with you when you did it. And they wrote everything down. Even the things in your mind. They wrote it down. And I have the evidence against you. James chapter 2. By the way, Romans 3, 19. Is just before Romans 3, 23. Which says. For all have sinned. Say it with me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Who has sinned? Who's guilty? God made it that way. That's why we went from one law with Adam to a whole bunch of laws in the Old Testament. And we've broken them. Oh, James chapter 2 Verse 9, but if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. That's what happened with that Cardinal Pell deal. Those judges, Supreme Court judges, had respect of persons. They probably took bribes or... Let me, let me, let's just think about this for a minute. Here's an organization called the Vatican where everybody, 1.7 billion people, tell the priests all their sins. Do you think they know stuff about you if you're a Catholic and you told them? Do you believe that the Jesuits keep files on people? Do you believe that, that there is... Do you believe those Supreme Court judges were probably doing things online or with other people that they didn't want published? And the Vatican knew that and they probably... Turned the screws down on them and said, we're going to release things about you unless you turn this thing around for that cardinal. That's what I think happened. 
And that's what James said. If you have respect to persons, you commit sin under convince of the law as transgressors. Let me say this. Hey, listen to me. Let me say this about how you see your family. Are the people in your family transgressors? Are your own family members wicked, hell-deserving sinners? Then don't think of them or don't portray them to other people as if they have never done anything wrong. That's one thing that always has just irked me about some parents is that they treat their children like they've never done anything wrong. Cubby, as a law officer, have you ever run into parents who were more angry with you than their son? I held back a few adjectives. I chewed them up and swallowed them so I wouldn't say them. They were more angry at the cop who arrested their child than they were at their child for what they did wrong. That's a respect of persons. Which is why we have Antifa. A bunch of communist terrorists who've never been punished for anything. They, when they arrested one of these guys up in Portland that was throwing chlorine bombs at the cops, when they came after him, the news article said that he crawled down in a fetal position and cried and wept like a little baby. <laughs> that boy has never been told in his life that he did anything wrong. At some point, you're going to have to wake up like I did. You're going to have to face your sins. Verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. And it goes the opposite. You can say, well, I've never murdered anybody and I've never committed adultery. And yet, if you're, I'm going to preach this this afternoon. Because we're in the part of Genesis 9 where Ham saw his father's nakedness. Now some people make that into some act that he did. And the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says plainly that he saw his father's nakedness. And there's laws against that. And Noah had to curse Ham's son, Canaan, as a result of it. When you treat people... As if they had never done anything wrong or you hide your own sins. Accusing everybody else and yet not recognizing your own or giving special treatment to people that you know have done wrong. You're, you're guilty. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye and so do, as they that should be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that showed, hath showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Let me tell you what that means. It means to those who have decided that they are going to just be hush about their own sins or the sins of others. When you show up to God's courtroom, God will look at you and he will have absolutely no mercy against you. While I was praying, God reminded me of that ticket that I got years ago that they wouldn't let me pay off. I had to go to court over it in Hillsboro. Great experience for me. Because I'm going, God, why, why am I here? And as I'm sitting there, I had my wife and kids with me and God was just opening my eyes because I just saw heaven. And had I, when that judge asked me that, first of all, somebody read off the charges, speeding and such and such in a zone or whatever. And the judge asked me, how do you plead? If I would have stomped my foot and threw a fit and said, that stupid cop, he didn't know what he was talking about. I, would, I, that was, I, I wasn't speeding. In fact, I, you know, and, and lie about it and try to say like I didn't do it. I guarantee you that judge would have thrown a book at me. Because he said, okay, if you want a trial, we'll have a trial. What we're going to do is we're going to bring the cop in and he's got the printout of the ticket 
And he's going to show what it read on his radar. And he's going to show that his radar gets inspected. He's going to show that it was you because you presented your license. They're going to put the evidence against you. And unless you've got evidence that proves that you didn't do it, you're guilty. But here's what happened. I said, I'm not, I said, I'm, I'm guilty. And the judge said, is there anything you want to say? You know what he was asking me? I want to hear, I want to hear this story. I want to hear from you whether or not I'm going to grant you mercy. And I told him what had happened. I had just done the funeral of our 13-year-old neighbor girl who on her birthday got a four-wheeler. Pretty girl, beautiful girl. Got on that four-wheeler on her birthday, on her first ride, got killed. And that was the only child they had. And I had just done her funeral. And that ought, when that judge heard that, he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a one-year suspension and sentence. And he said, if you can go a year without speeding, then this will, not, this will not be charged against you. It will go away, and it will be as if you had never done it. And buddy, I drove like grandma for a year. Because the judge saw that I was a merciful man. He showed me mercy. What is it that Jesus, when he taught us how to pray, Milton? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. If you can be merciful and have a merciful attitude, God will be merciful to you. So think about who, who you have not forgiven. Think about the, when you think about other people and the things that they have done wrong, do you not realize that you are just as guilty in the eyes of God as they are? And you might, here's, you know, you know, what, some, you know what some people do? There are people who go out and commit acts of adultery on a regular basis. And there are people who don't do that, and yet they are just as guilty because of lust. Which does God see as being more guilty than the other? He doesn't. They're equal. You think you're going to get by in God's courtroom? Listen, you are toast. There's no way out of it except God pardon you. So Psalm 25. Turn there. Psalm 25. If I were to ask us adults to stand and shout out so all the microphones and cameras could pick it up, the sins that you did between the ages of 14 and 18. Any takers? And I mean, don't hold back either. Any, anybody? Bunch of chickens. Look, at, look in your Bible in Psalm 25, verse 6. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth. I don't want to tell you stories. My children don't want to tell stories. My mama don't want to tell stories. My sister says too much sometimes. I'm just teasing. We always had a deal between us because she knew as much about me as I knew on her. Psst. Oh, mom's here. Never mind. <laughs> Remember not the sins of my youth nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he will teach sinners in the way. Hey, you know what that means? God says, I know you did wrong. Let me teach you how to do right. Which, is, which feels better? 
Now that you've been saved, you know, we know, how, we know how good sin feels, right? We know how good sin feels. And yet God teaches us a better way. And when we do what's right, it does feel better than doing wrong. Amen. He teaches sinners in the way. Um, the meek he will guide in judgment and the meek he will teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. We recognize that we are sinners before God. Jeremiah 33, verse 7. God said, and I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return and will build them as at the first. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me. When a, when a king, and I, I, I kind of looked up the laws of, of various countries. When a king or a prime minister or a president or a governor grants a judicial pardon. It is because the person has confessed their guilt. They have been found guilty. They are guilty. Some of them are serving the, the penalty for their crimes. And yet the governor will grant them a pardon. They are immediately released. They, and they can never, listen to me, they can never be accused of this crime ever again. It's called double jeopardy. And that was one of the things that they wrote into the Constitution to guarantee that the government has one chance against you. And even if you are guilty and found guilty, but once you have been pardoned, it will never return on you ever again. So look at Jeremiah chapter 50. In those days and at that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found. For I will pardon them whom I reserve. And we sing that song. What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. From the book of life, they've all been torn out. I don't remember them anymore. Amen. Verse, Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou, listen, here it is. Thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. And then, when you stand before God, and God says, let's hear the things that are against him. And the angels present themselves and say, Father... We find nothing laid to his charge. He is innocent. The judge can do that. The governor can do that. The president can do that. And they got that whole idea, Ron, from God. Who once he pardons your sins, they are gone forever. The Mormons teach, Finnis Dake, the Dake heresy teachers, you know what they teach? The Mormon church and, and some of these charismatic churches, you know what they teach? That if God forgives a sin and you go back, Gary, and commit that same sin again, that God unforgives the previous sin and holds it back against you. Now, you, now you've got double jeopardy on you. That's a lie. That's not our God. We don't have the same God. Amen. Isaiah 40, verse 1, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith the Lord your God. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Even Israel, even the Jews are going to be pardoned one of these days. Now, who is it that cannot be pardoned? Who is it? There are things, this is what got me. I didn't see this until, you know, I didn't preach this last Sunday, and I think maybe there's a reason. I didn't see this. There are things that when you get to God, He will not pardon you. Turn your Bible to 1 Samuel 15. Saul, 
Why did God... Here's, here's what God told David. David, you're going to have a son. I'm not going to let you build the temple. But you're going to have a son. And, and, this, and this son, I'm going to adopt him. And I will be his father and he will be my son. If he commit any iniquity... I will chastise him. I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of men. But my mercy will I, not, will I not take from him as I did to Saul. And he was speaking of Solomon. How many sins did Solomon commit? All of them. Multiple times. Into the hundreds or thousands of times. Solomon even beat, built temples for his wives and Burnt incense to false gods. And God forgave him. Do you know what the difference was? And here's Saul. He only commits one sin. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. And thy words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now Saul is confessing. But guess what? Now therefore I pray thee pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee for thou hast what? Rejected the word of the Lord. So here's my question. Can you go to heaven without believing the Bible? No. No, 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 no. You cannot go. He rejected the word of God. And God said, I will not have mercy on him any longer. And at that point, Samuel refused to forgive him. Thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it tore, it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel, he's talking about Christ, will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. If you, like Saul, reject the word of the Lord, God will reject you, and he'll not have pardon on your sins. And then 2 Kings 24, and I'm going to quit here. Turn to 2 Kings 24. The faster you get there, the faster we get out of here. Now, I'm not trying to get out of the service. I don't look at the service that way. I think, it's, I think I'm duty bound to give you the whole counsel of God. 2 Kings chapter 24. Here's a situation. Now, you listen to me. Does God, sh should God or will God, in your opinion, ever righteously judge America? Do you think America deserves the judgment of God? Do you think politicians, you think Nancy Pelosi... I mean, she's, she said that the hair shop set her up. They set me up. Stupid. You know, I couldn't care less whether she wore a mask and a hair salon. That, but her favoring the murdering of unborn children, I have a huge problem with that. Huge problem. So let's, I'm just going to deal with that one sin. Because that's what's here. 2 Kings 24 verse 1. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar king, he's talking about Jeho Jeho Jehoiakim. In Jehoiakim's days, Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon came up and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. And the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldees and bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the children of Ammon. One, two, three, four. Isn't that something? It's all right there, people. There's your fourth kingdom. According to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants, the prophets, surely at the commandments of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did. Do you know what Manasseh did? Manasseh murdered his own children. Made them pass through the fire to Moloch. Not somebody else's children. 
his own. Pastor Jason Cooley told me of an event that took place last night. You listen to this. I'm going to show you the hard heart, the hard heart of people. He was out street preaching Minneapolis last night. Him and his group. And they carry. And he said a Jewish woman came up to him, got in his face. She ran an abortion clinic. And Jason, I mean, I know the man. He spake, you know, he gets up and preaches, but he speaks softly to people face to face. And he don't back down. And she bragged about the murdered children in her abortion clinic. She boasted of what she had done. Ladies, help me out here. Wouldn't that bother you to work in a place where they rip babies' bodies apart? They take forceps and crush their skull inside the womb and pull them out. Or, in some cases, something happens and the child is actually born in the abortion mill and they killed the baby after it's born. You have no conscience. I don't like you. I would use the word hate. Because that's how I feel. Now, can God forgive a woman for doing that? He has. But you know what? The women that I've heard from who've aborted their child suffer from that for the rest of their life. You don't want to do that. You don't. So look at verse 4. And also for the innocent blood that he shed, for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon now, attitude goes a long way with God. Does God forgive the sin of murder? Yes. If you are sorrowful, and God always knows the difference. Have you ever had to say to your kids, say you're sorry? You ever said that? Jennifer, you ever said that to them boys? Say you're sorry. So they go, sorry. No, you're not sorry yet. <laughs> Amen. I would say to mom, I'm sorry. And mom would say, not yet. But you're fixing to be. And she was right. And then I was sorry. And Jason laid it out to her according to scripture. He said, ma'am, let me tell you something. You know the law. You're a Jewish woman. Thou shalt not kill which means thou shalt do no murder. You are taking the, the life of, a, of someone that God has put his breath in. The Bible, you know the scriptures that even Jeremiah said that when he was in the womb, God called him. And he laid out scripture to this Jewish woman of why what she was doing was a sin in the eyes of God. And he said, he told me, he said, he said I'm actually praying for this woman that something I said will ring inside her heart and she'll recognize the next time she performs an abortion in that clinic, she'll remember the word of the Lord and it'll cut her to pieces. And she'll repent. But yet, we have voted in consistently in the last 40 years, we have consistently voted in representatives who made sure that the Supreme Court never overturned Roe versus Wade. I'm praying that in this election, 
we get a conservative president, a super conservative majority in the House of Representatives, a conservative majority in the Senate, and we bring in two more judges that will overturn that nonsense. If we don't, God will judge this land for the innocent blood that was shed. And that's what God was doing here with Judah. Now I said I was going to close with that. And I'm going to ask you to bow your head this morning. I'm going to let you spend a moment with God. I'm going to leave these altars open if you want to come. God's dealing with you. Hey, if you've got sins that are unconfessed, unrepented, unpardoned, your guilt is, is gnawing at you. Your conscience is witness telling you, man, you need to repent of this. You need to, you need to call upon the name of the Lord. And I'm talking to saved people. Your sins, your, your wit, your conscience is telling you know what you did. You know what you said this week. You know what you were a part of this week. You know what you saw. You know what your body lusted after. You know those things. I pray that God will have long suffering with you and pardon you. And I know he will. Fooey on that nonsense. Somebody says, oh, God, if you commit the sin again, God don't forgive you no more. That's a lie. If we shall confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, he said. Will you seek a pardon from God this morning? I'm going to just call upon you this morning, if God's dealing with your heart, and you'd like to come to one of these benches here and just pour your heart out to God and say, God, I, I just need pardon. Maybe you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus, you don't know the Savior. You don't know if you've been forgiven by God. And I'm telling you, you need to be washed. You need a judicial pardon from God himself. Time alone does not wipe away your guiltiness. You do not, re you do not become innocent because you got over the sin. God must wash you and you must repent. The Bible says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of. Godly sorrow worketh repentance, the Bible says. Father, I come before you today. And Father, I know that the words last far beyond the preaching of the word. In people's hearts. I know, Father, that once the word is given, once the word is sown into people's lives, then in some cases it may take time for it to bring forth fruit. Father, I'm praying, dear God, not necessarily that somebody comes running down today, but, Father, that the seed planted in their heart, just like Brother Jason last night and that Jewish woman, he planted a seed in that woman's heart. Trying to show her her guiltiness before God. So that she could be saved. I know that's what he said. I know that's what he wanted. And Father, I'm the same way. Lord, I'm asking you, God, that the word goes forth into somebody's heart today. Bears root. Begins to bear fruit, Father. Showing the righteousness of Christ inside their life. That they have been pardoned from all their guiltiness. Father, my hope is that today somebody, somebody somewhere falls upon their face before you and says, God, I'm guilty. Will you have mercy on me, a sinner? Father, bless your word today. and Bless these people, we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen.